So after I talked to our two presenters uh, on the phone last week, I had some very simple-minded questions. I, I will throw those all away because you've opened up a, a whole new uh, area of, uh, of questioning in my mind. Those are two absolutely fascinating, uh, separate but related presentations. And, and uh, I think that we have perhaps 15-ish minutes uh, for, for questions. If uh, we can start with the audience. I want to yeah. Dr. Feinstein. Uh, emergency room physicians, uh, emergency room physicians, as a matter of course, see an awful lot of trauma. Uh, are they vulnerable? You know, I think um, trauma vulnerability is going to lie along a continuum, and the severity of trauma also lies along a continuum. The group that I've looked at um, have been exposed to the most extraordinary stresses. And so I see them at the far end of a spectrum. <coughs> I would suggest that the emergency room is you know, far, far, far removed from that. At the same time, you're quite right. There's some terrible sights in an emergency room. And I think that over the course of one's career in medicine, to a degree, you become inured to some of these things. You start habituating and shutting off to them. Um, certainly, that's a phenomenon I saw in these journalists who spend hours and hours looking at violent images. They habituate to it. Um, it kind of dulls their awareness. And I suspect to a degree that might happen in medicine. Maybe it's a necessary thing as well, because you cannot be constantly aroused by what you see. I just think that's too destructive. The I thought Dr. Dean Young, and then the person. So, so thank you. Um, I was very, thank you. It was wonderful, first of all, to see the inspiring faculty, uh, faculty members in faculty medicine. Just a plug for our faculty. Um, really wonderful to see. Uh, See, uh, to hear your, uh, your presentations today. I was thinking back to uh, General Lair's first slide where he showed the overlap of all the systems involved in a response and thinking how impossible it would be to navigate through such a complex system. And I was thinking about vulnerability and resilience. Um, and I just wondered what you both thought about uh, what we might do in uh, difficult situations, stre very stressful situations, to either reduce vulnerability or increase resilience. I had a conversation with a, a, a medical resident who told me about the flu season and how not only did they need a flu vaccine, but they were giving residents Tamiflu as well, and as, as well as medical staff to deal with the increased number of uh, a risk of flu. So I just wondered if you had pharmacologic ideas or you had uh, structure ideas that you think might help uh, reduce the amount of vulnerability and increase resilience? This is, um, that's an excellent, excellent question, and it's one that I think most of us have to, to ask ourselves, um, not just people who are exposed to the extremes, such as in the ER or uh, on the battlefield. Um, I, at the end of my talk, I was urging caution because a lot of pharmacological treatments may seem wonderful when you see a particular research study and you say, oh, yes, I want to go and sniff NPY peptide up my nose. I would love that. <laughs> um, the problem is that a lot of these have unintended consequences, and, and I would actually urge uh, a, an old remedy. Um, it might not be so practical on the battlefield, but in, in, in Toronto, I think it would be quite a good one, which is exercise or yoga. These engaging your physical body is a very powerful way of modifying your brain and modifying the genes expressed in your brain. And we don't understand the full capability of that, but it's been shown in animal models and preclinical models to, to have as restorative a power as, as the most, um, the gold standard of our, our psychiatric um, treatments for depression, for example. I'm not, not saying that for every illness it has the same effect, but in terms of depression and anxiety disorders, exercise has been shown to be equally powerful. Thank you. The gentleman behind, Trevor? Uh, I'll just, I think I'll just speak loudly. Uh, very interesting uh, presentations. Thank you. I wanted to ask, um, uh, you've touched on both the diagnosis uh, of these conditions, sort of determining after the fact when it's happened, and you're sort of describing predispositions towards it. I'm just, this is more of a question. Do you, do, you, do you lean towards sort of trying to preempt these conditions in the sense that if you could diagnose them in advance, you could head them off altogether and say, so maybe don't become a war journalist? Yeah. 
Um, or do you lean more towards treatment after the fact when you talk about using, say, SSRIs or um, cognitive behavioral therapy, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think with, with the war journalist group, um, my clinical experience is that those who develop distress respond very well to treatment. So um, I would be very leery about saying to a journalist, you shouldn't do this because you develop this particular disorder. I think the majority won't develop that disorder, and those that do, by clinical uh, uh, experiences, they will recover, and they can get back to doing what they, what they do. But I think they should prepare themselves beforehand. They should be knowledgeable about what might happen. So I'm a big fan of education, because what I found with this group is that they're psychologically very naive. Even though they're very smart individuals, um, they develop emotional distress, and they're not too sure what's going on. And they start making misattributions and misinterpretations of it. Education can cut through all of that. And I think in the process, they can um, develop a resilience from that. I think that's an excellent point about taking the tools to develop resilience. And, and that's one of the um, things I think will be the subject of the symposium later this afternoon as well. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, two, we have two questions, one here and then over here. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I, I was struck by um, the, in looking at the rats, that the early stress was seen as the point of pre-vulnerability in a sense. And I was thinking that in humans and in other mammals, early stress in childhood is, is very powerfully mediated by relationship and by attachment. Mm -hmm. And that, as General Dallaire spoke of this morning, social support uh, and relationships are an enormous protective factor, uh, both in a preventative sense and after the fact. Um, and so I was, I was just thinking that, that that points towards other types of interventions and also other types of vulnerabilities in terms of attachment style. And I think. That's a piece of research that I think is very interestingly attached to what you've presented. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just thought, do you have any thoughts about that? Or? I think that's a really interesting point um, in terms of ways that people can protect themselves later and, of course, ways that the, um, in our case, the, the, the rodent is becoming vulnerable in the first place. And that's work that we're doing in the lab currently where we're actually using a social isolation paradigm as a form of stress to look at what changes in the brain in a vulnerable set of animals. And that's work that I, I would like to talk about today, but because the um, information is not yet published, um, I thought I, w I should refrain because this, this is being recorded. Um, but I think it's a really powerful thing for us all to bear in mind because it's a way of, of reducing stress and um, especially um, on the causative end of things, I'd like to also caution the interpretation of the rodent model because what is uh, an early life stress that w results in adult psychopathology in a rat, it doesn't even result in adult psychopathology in a mouse, for example. So before one interprets this particular separation paradigm as being something we sh just shouldn't take this particular separation paradigm too literally. It works very well with the rat, but hopefully three hours separation from the mom at young life is not, is not causing that in humans. And particularly if the person has a, another attachment figure to whom they can transfer. I, I am very much reminded of this because I, as I drop off my, my young baby at daycare <laughs> um, and then start to talk about this work. So. Um, we're Thank you for bringing lying. up that point. A young lady here. Thank you both. Um, so there's been some talk, especially in the last uh, presentation, about how some of these things might actually be adaptive. And I'm just wondering if there's any research into whether um, for those who sort of live in these environments and don't come back, who aren't journalists who travel and return, whether these are actually sort of like activation or hypo hyperactivation, hypoactivation, or 5-HT uh, receptor upregulation, whether those are seen as potential uh, adaptive traits that could be looked at as um, beneficial or, or lending survival benefit to people who are going to be in those environments long term. 
So I'm just wondering if it's been looked at from that sort of vantage point. There, there is currently some work that is going on. Um, uh, the Lesh group in Europe has been looking at uh, the serotonin transporter polymorphism, so slight differences in the gene. And there, after a lot of controversial research, some groups saying this is a, a vulnerability um, polymorphism and other groups saying, well, we don't see it. They're raising the idea that perhaps it's a plasticity polymorphism. So it's actually um, something, a difference in a gene that makes the person better able to respond to either in a uh, positive intervention or a negative intervention, and that might be involved in canceling out its biological effects. But I'm sure Dr. Feinstein has some thoughts on protective features. Uh, thank you for your interesting lectures. I have a specific question about the sample size for the twins whose prefrontal cortex was studied. Could you please comment on that? Sample size for the prefrontal cortex, I didn't hear. Were you talking about the preclinical or the uh, clinical? How many twins were studied? That was a fairly small group. So for the functional imaging study, it was like each group was about 12, so 12 from each condition. Um, but I believe it was slightly larger group for the, just the brain activation. But I, it is a very small group, and, and um, there is a lot of controversy within this field, and I hope to, I, I framed that appropriately. So I think we're to, clear, nearly to the end of our uh, time here, so I'm going to uh, I'll suggest that you've already talked about the, uh, uh, the questions that come up about opportunities for inoculation, for prevention or inoculation or intravenous resilience at some point in the future. But what, what's striking to me is, again, the complexity, the small samples that you have to deal with, the international nature of the work, and I'm wondering if, if either or both of you could just speak briefly to the need in Toronto, in your environment, to have access to uh, enormous databases, uh, longitudinal horizontal databases, to answer these very um, uh, complex and confusing questions that are uh, looking at both genetics, epigenetics. I have not heard the term um, uh, epigenetic plasticity before and the uh, international nature of this. Do we have big data facilities and capabilities in this city, and where should we go with that? Not, 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 in, my, not in my field, no. Um, in, in fact, it's quite difficult to do this work here because there aren't huge numbers of war journalists in this country. Um, so you've really got to look, look outside the board. I mean, there's some very well-known war journalists over here, but the group is extremely small. So to collect adequate sample sizes for this kind of work, you've really got to look elsewhere. And then you've got to bring in multiple news organizations as well. And without belaboring the point, what's happening now, because of budgetary cuts, people are, you know, organizations are cutting back on the number of journalists who are doing foreign news as well. Bureaus are closing. So to get adequate sample sizes is a struggle with this kind of work that I do. I can talk to the epigenetic point. Um, the, I, the concept introduced by Dr. Zan, epigenetics, it sort of, um, I, can I, how many of you have heard the word epigenetic before? Oh, wow, okay, fabulous. <laughs> well, I won't ask each one of you to define it, um, but it refers broadly to um, uh, change that's not embedded in the DNA, but how that DNA is being expressed. And it is something that is inheritable, at least for one or two generations. So it's a thought, it's almost Lamarckian in a sense, that something can happen that might change your DNA that you may pass down to your offspring. And when you see a microarray like what I showed, where the early life stress rats have very different gene expression in their prefrontal cortex, that's one of the things that makes scientists really prick up their ears and think, oh, this might be an epigenetic effect. There's a different program of genes that are be is, has been turned on by this experience. Uh, whether it's a developmental program that just keeps going it is something that my colleagues in India are, are investigating right now. Um, but the idea that you might be able to s 
meddle a little bit with the epigenetics, with histone deacetylases, for example, and, and turn off this epigenetic program or restore a normal one is, is very tantalizing and it's the subject of a lot of research. Um, but of course, the, the flip side of that, anything that can turn on a whole bunch of genes or turn off a whole bunch of genes all at once is something that has to be viewed with extreme caution. So it's a really interesting topic for future research, but one that will take a lot more cl preclinical work, I believe. So thank you to both of you for, first of all, the work that you're doing and for these uh, great and thought-provoking presentations. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Angel to let us go on break. The umbrella presentation is deferred until uh, after the next uh, uh, session, but now we uh, adjourn for ref uh, refreshment uh, into the uh, common room and reconvene in 15 minutes. So we have an exciting panel. I want to make sure all of you come back so you can participate in this uh, exchange and thank the uh, speakers of this last uh, uh, session for their presentation and their work. Thank you so much.